Hi guys, um, I'm going to, in this video, do uh, some explaining about math cows and my own methods and philosophy of doing a math cow. They are a little bit different than what you see in Cobb documentation and what you see from different folks on forums. And that's not to say that they're wrong, but uh, their methods didn't really make sense, and I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. So let me explain a little bit about math curves in general. And in ATR, I have a math table A, and in Gen 1s and Speed 6s, this is my Speed 6 math curve. Um, Gen 1s and Speed 6s have two math tables, A and B. Gen 2s have a single math table. And what, uh, what happens here is you have a math voltage uh, 0 to 5 volts, and that's the actual sensor voltage. And then the ECU translates the voltage into a an airflow um, reading in terms of grams per second. And that's uh, based on size of the intake. So, because we're translating a voltage to a grams per second, there's going to be some error associated with our translation. And the ECU compensates for that error by using fuel trims. And fuel trims are only used in closed loop operation for speed sixes and gen ones. In gen twos, there is, at this time, you know, sometime in the future, this may not be true, but in gen twos, there is a full throttle compensation that we actually don't have access to yet in ATR. Not a big deal because the uh, the general idea here is still the exact same and how you correct your math curve is still the same. Now fuel trims are just additive or subtractive values applied to your math curve. Now, long-term fuel trims are learned over time, and they're stored. And short-term fuel trims are instantaneous trims on top of your long-term fuel trims. Now, to aid with the long-term fuel trims, the ECU breaks up the math curve into segments, and those are seen if you take a look in your closed loop tables you have your LTFT learning zones A through F for speed sixes I believe gen ones and gen twos are slightly different but the point is the ECU breaks the math curve into different segments where long-term fuel trims are applied so learning zone A as seen here starts at zero grams per second and it goes up to 5.7 grams per second. And that means there's going to be one long-term fuel trim value, additive or subtractive, uh, that it applies to the math curve within that region. And breakpoint B is 18 grams per second, so we should see a second long-term fuel trim value between 5.7 and 18 grams per second. The same thing between 18 and 30 grams per second, 30 to 80 grams per second, 80 to 120 grams per second, and 120 to 200. Now, just to note, you can change these breakpoints if you know where you're going to transition into open loop. You can set all of your breakpoints to give you more resolution within your closed loop operation range. It just allows the ECU to transition a little bit easier once you have your math curve set. Now, where I differ in doing a math calibration is the actual zones uh, and how I apply corrections to those zones. A lot of folks say just to take your long-term fuel trim regions and multiply your math curve within that region by, you know, some correction factor based on your long-term fuel trims. But um, that doesn't really make sense because 
let's see, let's take the 0 to 5.7 grams per second region as an example. So we have 0 up to, well, we'll say 5.13. And if you apply a single correction factor, that doesn't really consider what's going on within that segment. And there could be, and there are, dips and bumps within individual breakpoint segments. But if you're applying just a single correction factor, it doesn't compensate for that. And additionally, if you use single correction factors in the individual breakpoint regions, you can create very abrupt transitions between those regions. And what I mean by that is if we were to multiply the 0 to 5.13 by, say, a correction factor of 10%, multiplying by 1.10, and your neighboring region has a negative long-term fuel trim, where we multiply by, say, 0.9, you might actually create a transition where you where it looks like it's decreasing in airflow. And that doesn't really make sense when, you know, things are mechanically sound. Uh, that doesn't make sense at all. And what happens, or what can happen, if you have that very abrupt change in your fueling calculation, you can actually create uh, a jerky transition that you can actually feel in the car as it transitions between breakpoints. And another region where we often see that jerkiness is the transition between closed loop operation and open loop operation. So my goal has always been to correct within the regions and also between the breakpoints, trying to smooth everything out. And if you've ever talked to me about math cals, um, and I've talked to a lot of folks about this over the past few years, I've told them to not even consider the breakpoint values because we can actually look at a correction factor over the entire curve and my goal has been to create a correction curve for the math curve and I do that by utilizing both long-term and short-term trims and I use short-term trims to sort of guide my blending of these regions and within the regions themselves. So let's take a look at a data log. And this is just a MathCal data log that I pulled from my Speed 6. Now, I'm going to show you graphically how I actually perform a MathCal data log. And I do it differently because I take one data log for both closed loop and open loop operation. So let me go ahead and throw this into a pivot chart. And I, um, I made a video about pivot charts previously, so if you want to take a look at that and learn how to use these, if you don't, um, go ahead. Pivot charts are extremely powerful. So here I'm just going to graph over time. Time is the x-axis. And let me throw this onto a secondary so we have a little bit better resolution. Now this lower line here, this red line, is vehicle speed. And you can see starting out, I'm actually not moving. I'm in neutral at a stop. And you can see an RPM. I rev the engine very slowly. It takes about 15 seconds. I, I rev it to about 4,000 RPM. And then I let the RPMs fall back down to idle. And then I start driving in the car. And this is first gear, second gear, and then I drive it through third gear up to about 4,000 RPM. And that's just driving it very smoothly, I'm just trying to bring up the airflow. And then I let it come back down to about 2,800 RPM. And this is in third gear. And then very slowly, I increase throttle to start to bring in boost, and then somewhere around 4,500 RPM, 4,500 to 5,000 RPM, I am full throttle, and uh, I take it all the way up to about 6,000 RPM. So let me show you that 
in terms of boost. And in terms of boost, for the most part, where I rev it and where I'm just driving it, I'm below zero PSI. And then when I'm in third gear for that last segment, I, uh, I bring up boost slowly, smoothly, and then it, uh, it peaks at about 17 pounds. So looking at this in terms of mass airflow, we can see it covers the entire region from idle, which was about 2.9 grams per second, all the way up to you know peak airflow of 290 grams per second. And the key with doing a MathCal and a data log like this is being very, very smooth on the throttle so that you don't have very abrupt changes in airflow. And that's going to allow the short-term fuel trims to guide our transitions and to guide our blending of the MAF curve. So going back to the MAF curve and the MAF correction, which is long-term fuel trims, if we graph over MAF grams per second as your x-axis and long-term fuel trims, I'm going to average these, we should see something that resembles the breakpoint regions in terms of long-term fuel trims. Now, going back to the breakpoints for a second, the first breakpoint was at 5.7 grams per second. So we should see a long-term fuel trim within that region. And we roughly do starting at idle 2.9 2.94 grams per second we see a correction factor of it 2.96 and that's an added 2.96% fuel LTFT positive 2.96 and that uh, that's static up to mm, about 4.18 and then there's a little bit of blending region there's a there's a transition range for your different long-term fuel trims and about 5.7 seconds is where we see the next the next fuel trim take over now that next fuel trim should last until about 18 grams per second and roughly here's 18 grams per second for the most part it's a single it's a single fuel trim now zone C should last up to about 30 grams per second. So here's 18, here's 30 grams per second. And we do have, you know, a general trend of one fuel trim. But you can see that there's some, uh, some other correction factor applied. And it's a blend of your previous and your next. But um, the next trim region should be up to 80 grams per second here is 80 grams per second and we do see in general one fuel trim and this region up to 120 grams per second here's 120 grams per second now with my car I transitioned to open loop before the end of this breakpoint so this correction factor at the very very end which is negative 0.16 is actually open loop operation and in speed 6s and gen 1s, negative 0.16 fuel trim is your indicator for open loop operation. If both long term and short term are negative 0.16, that's typically, um, that's typically open loop operation. So just bringing in short term fuel trims for a second, and I'm going to average these. You can see how these can aid in the transitional ranges. So here, <clears throat> zero short-term fuel trim means that there's no trim being applied on top of your long-term fuel trim. Now, in this transition range, and even into the middle of this next range, which was 5.7 to 18 grams per second, short-term fuel trims <clears throat> 
are adding fuel. Short-term fuel trims are above zero, so they're adding fuel on top of your long-term fuel trim. And we can see how short terms are, for the most part, pretty smooth. And it goes up, and then it comes back down. And you can see how it relates to the transitional ranges of your fuel trims. And then in this middle, where we saw so much disparity of the 18 to 30 gram per second long-term fuel trim, short-term fuel trims give us a very good idea of what's happening because it's adding fuel and quite a bit of fuel, 15%, in the, in the middle of this long-term fuel trim. But the long-term fuel trim is telling us that it's pulling 4%. It's a negative 4% long-term fuel trim. But there's an additive 15%, say, in this region. So 15 minus your 4% long-term fuel trim, that's 15 plus a negative 4, it's actually adding 11% of fuel. So just looking at long-term fuel trims, we never would have seen that and the MathCal actually would have been further off had we corrected to just a negative 4% long-term fuel trim. So that's about it for looking at the math curve and the how the long-term and short-term fuel trims are applied. In my next video, I will show how to actually begin correcting your math curve based on both long-term and short-term trims where we can blend. That's it for now. Um, stay tuned, I guess, and hopefully we can sort out the math curve in the next video. Thanks, guys.